Let's go, folks. This is still potable. The playoff edition, maybe around too late, but we got there. That's the new intro from T Money. Also included the uh, the newest Celtics theme song, "Let's Go Celtics." And I'm beginning to think T Money might be the author of that as well. I am Sam Jam Packer, joined as always from MassLive.com, Brian B Rob Rob, and from the Athletic J King, the father. Uh, we are here on the CLNS YouTube page. We are brought to you by Prize Picks and Game Time. Use promo code CLNS if you want some money off both of those two fantastic products. We are here in the playoffs, as T Money mentioned in the brilliant intro. And the Celtics finally have a second round opponent as the Cleveland Cavaliers take down the Orlando Magic in seven games. Um, seven ugly games, I would say. I was uh, pretty upset they forced me to watch games five, six, and seven of that basketball series you kind of have a a very hobbled five six and seven were good games they were close games they were Exciting close games. games i don't know if they were good games they're definitely close uh but i don't know if it was the highest level of uh, quality basketball there's just so many three open three-point shots took mostly by the magic but some by the Cavs. and i uh i said to myself the celtics make those shots and there's just not a lot of three-point shooting um in that series. And I think that'll be a difference in this series. But what I wanted to say is the South, uh, the Cavs kind of a hobbled team. Jared Allen has broken ribs um, and apparently is having trouble breathing. And so I don't expect to see him early on in this series. Dean Wade, the biggest Celtics nemesis uh, on the Cavs this year. He's also out has been out, I think since March 13th, don't expect to see him in the first couple of games of the series. And then Donovan Mitchell has had a hurt knee pretty much since the all-star break. Did not stop him from scoring 50 and 40 uh, over game six and seven, but still does not look like they have the same bounce. And so, B Rob, I'll go to go to you first. What is what is your, kind of your expectation of this Cavs team um, heading into this series starting on Tuesday? To be honest, not a lot. <laughs> like, yeah, I'll, I'll just be frank. Like, if this series go, I mean, it, it could. Like, the, the Cavs do have more. Or health, a health, still a health, much healthier roster than the Heat do, and this should be on paper a bigger challenge than the Miami. That series went to five, but I would be surprised if this series goes six or more games if the Celtics play to their level, just because defense, like offensively, the Cavs don't have a lot of shooting outside of the back. We're not a lot of relying on shooting outside of Mitchell and, and Max Drews and Garland on certain nights if he has it going. Um, and you just look down the the depth of this roster right now, and we see Tristan Thompson and and Mook, and I don't want to slander Mook here, but like if those guys are getting minutes in the in, in the playoffs right now, that's just not a good sign for your team. It's not slander if it's true. Yeah, it's it's fair. It's good not. legal analysis. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, yeah. The, so compared to Orlando, Cleveland is more dynamic. One big question is what Darius Garland do they get against the Celtics because he has recently been not as aggressive and he had a, a good game six second half of game seven. He helped them, you know, finish that off, but he, he, he can be super dynamic and he can be very tough to guard and he and Mitchell can give them just a backcourt. That's a handful to deal with, but we haven't always seen that Darius Garland lately. And so that that's one big question to me is, can he sort of come out of the shell that he's developed recently? Can he play at a super high level one, but also carry a big burden on offense, which he hasn't either been willing or able to do? Um, and like they're going to need a lot from him because that series against Orlando, they were struggled to reach 100 points. The fourth quarter of game six, Donovan Mitchell scored 18 points. His teammates scored zero. 
They took a five point lead into that quarter. Mitchell went absolutely berserk, had 18 points, and they lost. So they're not getting a lot of offense from everybody else. This is a team that had a kind of weird season. Like, Such an up and down it, season. Just and so they, many crazy runs with injuries and stuff. And they stumbled into their best run of the season when they had Garland and Mobley out. And they played super s- small. They played with a ton of shooting, and they were just launching threes around Mitchell, who can get to the hoop against basically anybody. And they don't really play that way anymore when they're healthy. I, I think it was almost maybe a good thing for them that Allen missed the last portion of that series because they play better when they go smaller. They play better when they launch threes. They brought Sam Merrill into that game seven. And Sam Merrill, guy's got some flaws as a player, but he's also one of the best and highest volume shooters per minute he's on the court in the entire NBA. And so it'll be interesting to see how they how they reevaluate things. Um if Allen plays early in the series, I think he probably will. It's just bruised ribs. I'm, he's having trouble breathing, Jay. Breathing's important. I'm surprised that he stayed out as long as he did. I wouldn't be surprised to see him early in the series. Just, just ignoring the difficulty breathing portion of all that. <laughs> but you're right, Jay. Do you think that was calculated being like, listen, if he's not, if he's definitely not hundred percent, we just don't want him anyway right now because of the shoot, because of the, we don't need two bigs against this team. Like I don't know. Late, um, but it, like, if you look at their numbers all season, they were plus one point something with both Allen and Mobley on the court and their offense really suffered during those minutes and they just never scored well with both the big guys on the court and the flip side of that is neither of those guys are great offensive players either Allen can hurt you with lobs Mobley can he's got a little bit of passing a little bit of ball handling he can finish sometimes but like they're not super physical guys they're not going to be shooting threes neither of them um and so it, it's kind of like, like defensively, those guys can can really be great, and and that that will be an issue for the Celtics if they can't stretch out the court. But offensively, that look has has given the Cavs problems, um, and they they never could figure that out. So that's just something to kind of monitor throughout the series: is can they survive against Boston with two big guys on the court? Can they guard Boston with both those big guys on the court? And Mobley can really guard the perimeter. Like they might be able to do it. Um, but with Al Horford, like it's a little different playing the Celtics with Al Horford because Chris Stops, they use and he's rolling. He is posting up. He is oftentimes inside the arc. Whereas Al Horford, he's basically a spot up guy. And and I feel like in some ways Al Horford might even make it more difficult on bigs to guard him because he's just going to space up and and if you help off him then then you could be in trouble. So I don't I don't know what the Cavs do there with with Jared Allen if he if he plays here. It could be an issue for them that that Horford's out there and and presumably just spotting up and spacing out to the three-pointer. I think it's interesting like I think the Cavs strength is a lot in their their two bigs but like you force Mobley to the five Garland and Donovan Mitchell are two smaller guards, and like the, the kind of the flaw in this Cab team has always been just not having a lot of depth on the wing. And I think maybe they like you they could throw Evan Mobley on someone like Jason Tatum and have some size, but I just don't know how they're going to slow down the Celtics' wings at this point. And there's just so much stress right now on like I was slightly tongue in cheek mentioning about how important Dean Wade is. But Dean Wade's a pretty solid three-point shooter, a 6'10 guy. Dean Wade's good. And a solid good. defender. He gets, like, the same Sam Hauser treatment of, like, goofy-looking white guy. You don't think he can defend. But he's a solid defender. And so him not being out there, it puts a lot of stress on um, Max Struess, George's Niang, um, Sam Merrill. Just There are a bunch of guys out there who are just not, I guess, great two-way players on the wing. And so I don't know – without Jared Allen out there, how the Cavs are going to go about really slowing down this Celtics team because who I just don't know who they can really put on Jason Tatum um, and not have to put two to the ball. Like, if they just try to play him straight up, I feel like Tatum and, and Jalen are, are going to have big performances, and if they show extra help and put two on the ball, the Celtics have been so good at punishing that all season. 
Yeah, I mean, Okoro's their best wing defender, but the problem is when you play him, that's just a huge win for the Celtics on the other end of the floor. There's a reason the entire league calls him Isaac Noscoro. Um, right. Does yeah. the entire league call him that? <laughs> Thank you for uh, explaining my joke, Jay. Yes. Um, and the other problem with the Cavs now, I mean, like, Niang played four minutes in Game 7. He's, he was an absolute disaster um, shooting-wise in the in the Magic series. Shot 13% from three-point range. Uh, so when it's like your alternatives to that of like, okay, you want to get some shooting on the floor, like Struess, we, we kind of saw like, they're going to keep, they're going to pick on him. They're going to at least try to pick on him. He's not as bad as Duncan Robinson defensively, but he certainly is not going to be a Jalen Brown or a Jason Tatum stopper one-on-one. And then you have just literally nothing outside of that beyond a guy in Okoro who is uh, a net negative offensively. So yeah, like the, the Cavs have a lot of problems in this series, even without, with forcing us out. And um, I think, Patrick, you're right. Like, that's number one on the list, being like, okay, how the hell do they slow down uh, the Celtics' firepower in the wing? And and then how much can Donovan Mitchell handle? Mitchell has killed the Celtics over the years. Like, he's had so many big games against them. Um, he, he can really put a fright into you. And when he gets going, there aren't that many guys in the league that are tougher to shut off once they get going than Donovan Mitchell. But how much can he get his teammates involved? And I, I wonder if the Celtics will just kind of let Donovan not not try to get his, but like just shut off everybody else. Mm-hmm. Make sure, like, maybe put Drew Holiday on Darius Garland and just have him be physical with Garland and have him hound Garland and see if he can just shut 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 off Garland. And then Struce can really shoot, but. He's not a guy who's going to create his own shot. Um, Mobley, we've talked about, just kind of a limited offensive player. Allen, he's just a, a dunker and and layup finisher. He's he's not going to do anything else. Um, Levert, every once in a while, he'll get hot. The Celtics know that. They know that all too well. But he's not a guy that really scares you. And I thought throughout that first round, Orlando did a great job of just like – Shutting down everyone outside of Mitchell. Mitchell was fantastic, but but they didn't let anyone else get going. And that game six was a perfect example. Like Mitchell had fifty, they couldn't even crack a hundred as a team, which is crazy, <laughs> absolutely crazy. But but that that seemed to be Orlando's game plan, at least in that game, was like, go ahead, Donovan, we're gonna not cover you totally one on one, but not send too much help. Make sure the other guys don't get going. And I think the Celtics might try to do that. This this Cavaliers offense has been pretty good at times in the regular season, but really struggled against New York last season in the playoffs. And and they're a little different now. They have Struess. Um, they made some upgrades roster wise, but but they they really struggled again scoring against Orlando. And Orlando's got a great defense. Orlando is big and fierce and physical. And Jalen Suggs is flying around mucking things up so it's not an easy team to score on but but you're gonna have to score to keep pace with boston like it's it's not going to be enough to just win a rock fight with boston because i don't think you can slow down the celtics a little bit but you're not going to turn them into what orlando was during that first round there's just no chance no matter what type of defense the celtics go against that they'll look like that all right, let's take a break here to hear from our sponsor, Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and the most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. March may be over now, but the biggest moments in college basketball tip off this month at the Final Four be a part of it. All the action on Prize Picks for both men and women's college basketball coming up this weekend and you can also get in on the nba playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level the basketball's postseason the playoffs begin obviously in two weeks but you can get in the playing round starting on april 16th at prize picks so i know on the, in the final couple weeks of the regular season here one area to keep an eye on on prize picks will be certainly the Celtics and some of their bench players. I think there are going to be a lot more opportunities there for the likes of Payne Pritchard, Sam Howes of the world, while the starters rest up. So keep an eye on that. So if you want to check out Prize Picks, you can download the app today and use the code 
CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's CLNS on price picks for a first deposit match up to $100 on price picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy on price picks. And now back to the show. How much do you think the Celtics defense changes that they because they don't have Chris Tapps now um, and just is lacking his rim protection? Like, it feels like the Cavs, like any team that's going to, uh, I think, beat Boston in a series has got to kind of, I don't know, necessarily match them from the three-point line, but stay in the game from three. Um, the Cavs, I was just looking back on the, the matchups between the regular season very weird season series where they had two games back to back in Boston in December. Um, the Cavs actually outshot the Celtics from three and one of them and still lost. I think the, the Celtics came back from a big lead in the first quarter there. Um, Celtics did not shoot very well from three uh, in the second game, but still ended up winning. Mitchell had a bigger game. And then obviously had the crazy comeback um, Dean Wade performance uh, in that fourth quarter. That was a hilarious game. It was uh, absolutely that was March, that was March, right? Yeah, that was March. That was I, one of the last games uh, Dean Wade actually played in. But I'm just curious, um, B Rob, like, what do you think the Celtics' defensive approach is going to be? They don't have Chris Tapps like protecting the rim. Is it just like, as Jay mentioned, just letting Donovan Mitchell kind of get his? Is it like you have Al Horford out there? You kind of have more switchable people, just not letting teams get threes that way. What do you think the Celtics are going to do to try and slow down um, the Cavs here? Yeah, I mean, I honestly think Jay nailed in terms of like the Celtics have. Drew Holiday and Derek White in the backcourt. And this is the perfect team to have those guys against in terms of like, like letting those guys body up as much as they can against Garland and Mitchell. And Gar- Garland to me is a fascinating part because if Garland is at full strength and this becomes not an interesting series, but you can see it become a competitive series because that's, he's just a, a, just a hell of a tough cover when he has it going with the speed he has and his ability to pull it up. But like Jay said, like he's averaged, he averaged 15 points a game in that magic series, despite shooting like 47% from the field, 41% from three. So he has not been aggressive. He was like a net negative in game seven today, just in terms of his tentativeness and the not having confidence in the jump shot. So life becomes a lot easier for the Celtics. If, if it, the less aggressive Garland comes into play, because then you can just really focus in on Mitchell and stay home on the shooters. And like, I think it's, you've learned a lesson from what you did against the heat of like, you don't want to make these guys give them dare shots for their like non shooters, if you will. Um, but at the same time, you can, you trust everyone in your defense. This is a well-rounded defense. It has been all year long when everyone's locked in and against this team, against the Cavs team was, that was maybe slightly better offensively than heat in the regular season that like the formula, I think kind of just sticks there. Yeah. One of the biggest storylines in, in this series too, could be rebounding. Cleveland has done a pretty bad job of defensive rebounding. They got absolutely destroyed by the Knicks last year. That's that's nothing to be truly ashamed of. But it's it's hard to be like a a big front court with two traditional guys and you still get out rebounded and and the Cavs do it pretty regularly. Um they're defensive rebound rate in the first round was 69.6%, which was pretty bad. Um, and so with the Celtics renewed emphasis on on crashing the glass this year, I do wonder if they can take advantage of them a little bit, especially not just with the, the bigs, but crash against Mitchell, crash against Darius Garland. Some of the Celtics better offensive rebound, more active offensive rebounders are their guards. And so I think that that could be a huge factor in this series. Just just keep crashing, keep crashing. Um, and I, I think they'll have a lot of success if if they're physical enough, if if they put an emphasis on that. Um, Especially with Allen out, like they just started in game seven at forward Struess and Okoro. We're just not like they're both what I would say small forwards. There's just not a lot of size there. I think it says potential for the, the wings to really crash down uh, and get um, a lot of boards just because the Cavs are a kind of a small team without, without Allen and without Dean Wade. Um, there's not a lot of size uh, on this Cavs team throughout the roster. Um, I was just looking at the box score right now. Another huge advantage for the Celtics has to be the bench. Like they're playing Tristan Thompson in, in basketball games in the playoffs. I think that's a good <laughs> sign for the Boston Celtics. They're also playing 
like I'm not going to slander Marcus Morris, as Jay said, it's true, but he sh- probably shouldn't be playing uh, a lot of minutes. If you just look at their bench right now, Karis LeVert is the kind of their main guy off the bench. Jay mentioned Sam Merrill, who's uh, a kind of a one-way player, but the Celtics, as we've seen, have um, just a much more competent bench with Pritchard, Hauser. I think it's going to be a series where you can play a lot more Luke Cornett, just especially um, if there's not a lot of size. It feels like the Celtics, at least in the in the first round matchup against the Heat, there were never times they were like, "Oh, a bench lineup is in." They're not going to be as dangerous. It feels like anytime Tristan Thompson's on the court for the Cavs, that like that's automatically a, a win for the Celtics. And um, I think the depth is just going to come up huge here uh, playing against this shorthanded Cavs team. Without yeah. doubt, and then on top of that, they're coming off the seven game series right now. So these guys, like Mitchell, is already hobbling out there on his knee. Played forty-five minutes on Sunday. Uh, they don't really have any good, reliable guards. Off the bench down here. though. Yeah, that that's man, true. That man scored a whole bunch. Of points. <laughs> um, but yeah, it is like the 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 Cavs bench does not make sense for a team that is like the fourth or fifth seed in the Eastern Conference at this point. And some of that is injuries. Like things make a little more sense if Jared Allen gets healthy and is back in the starting lamp or is even bring him back off the bench then like that makes sense there but the Celtics should have advantages pretty much everywhere at the best as long as they can keep Lavert under control and um yeah it's uh it, it's bodes well for again to for the Celtics to keep minutes down while taking care of business quickly in this series and and one thing I wonder about with the Cavs is is whether they just have a regular season defense like they they were I think seventh ranked in defense this season. When Allen and Mobley out there, those guys have a lot of size. They can clean up a lot. Mobley had I think it was four blocks in Game Seven. He can really protect the rim, but he could also move his feet. He can stay in front of guys. We've seen him match up against Jason Tatum and legitimately be his matchup. Not even just switching onto him during some key possessions against the Celtics in the past. But they just have like there are just guys you can go after. Like you can you can go after Max Struess. You can go after Darius Garland. You can go after Donovan Mitchell. You can go after Niang if he's in there. You can go after Sam Merrill. Like there are just a number of guys that you're not going to be a, afraid of of running offense at. There are a number of guys that the Celtics should look at and think, this is a great matchup for us. And and if you're able to pull Allen at least away from the rim, if you're able to pull have Mobley on Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown, so he's occupied, then then there could be a lot of space in the middle to attack not great individual defenders on the perimeter. So I do wonder if if it's kind of like not a complete illusion, but if their defense isn't nearly as good as the numbers say when you get to a playoff chess match and and teams are attacking you in your vul- most vulnerable spots and going out of their way to to game plan and and put those guys in the actions time after time. I think there are just like weak links that the Celtics can just press on a little bit. Would you guys say is the worst second round team? Uh, in the playoffs right now. In the playoffs right now, Pacers. yeah. Yeah, to like Pacers. I would still. I think the pay. I'd be. I think the Pacers would be a tougher out than the Cavs at this point. Because the Pacers at least do something like at an elite level in scoring, even though they haven't looked the same with Halliburton just hasn't looked. Right. Uh, He's just not that level. It feels like the Cavs are just kind of middling. Uh, like they're a better defensive team, but they're very middling um, offensive team. And as Jay said, maybe their, their defense isn't very much built for the playoffs. Folks, it is time for the NBA playoffs, and that is exciting. And if you want to get in the building to watch the Boston Celtics, you got to go to Game Time. Game Time is the authorized ticket marketplace of the NBA, which makes getting playoff tickets even faster and easier. Prices on Game Time app actually go down the closer you get to tip off. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, and views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets. Game Time has last minute deals. You can save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater tickets. If you want to go see some stand up, I've used Game Time. I went and saw Dan Soder uh, at the Wilbur Theater. 
fantastic stuff on game time. They have flash deals, zone deals, all in pricing, and you can see seat views from wherever you're sitting. They have a lowest price guarantee, and that's why you need to take the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets with game time. Go to the game time app, create an account, and use the code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply, but again, create that account and redeem code CLNS for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. A stat I saw, I think the Cavs made 70 threes. No, less than that. Basically, the Celtics made more threes in their five-game series than the Cavs did in their seven-game series against the Magic. So playing two more games, I just think the Celtics... It comes back to a math thing, and I don't think this the the Cavs have the firepower to kind of keep up with uh, this version of the Boston Celtics. Um, that being said, I'm 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 curious what you guys think. Which player on the Cavs do you think um, is the Caleb Martin of this series? And potentially related question, but doesn't have to be. Which player on the Cavs? Caleb Martin, 2024, or Caleb Martin, 2023. <laughs> You have to specify the dirty slash, player or no? slash game two, Caleb Martin. Um, which one is the is most likely to have this uh, kind of a hot shooting? Lavert, Lavert for sure. <laughs> Could, I think Levert. it's Struce. I think Struce still has maybe some of that heat magic. Uh, but Struce isn't going to like break you off. And Struce also the game plan is going to be to take away his threes, so they're going to be locked in on doing that. Lavert. Game plan could be close out short, and he he could just get hot, and he can also put the ball on the floor a little bit. I think it's Levert. Yeah, I think it. And the Celtics will be ready for that because they saw that firsthand um, when he was in Brooklyn plenty of times, and even points I think last year when the Cavs had their way of the Celtics. Yeah, I think he had some big games in there one too, time. right? But yeah. another, I mean, we haven't talked about it all yet um, as far as the coaching matchup in this series goes. Did you guys see that? Bickerstaff, like they're booing Bickerstaff in Cleveland or like lightly booing him during intros in the playoff series. A nice light boo, a polite boo. A nice a play, <laughs> play, like, like we want you to lose this game and get fired after game seven. I mean, so that's a situation where, as you was talking about, where there's like a regular season defense, like the Bickerstaff was certainly coaching for his job after game seven, but he is, um, he has not made a lot of fans in Cleveland over the years with just a lot of the schemes. A lot of like some of the lineup choices, I think. Um, and now in this series, like Joe, I thought had a great series against the Heat after game two. Once he kind of, um, you know, they shaped things up on the defense, um, took away the threes. And now they're going to have a full week here to prepare for this team going into it. And bigger staff, I don't think they're, you, you don't have the, the Spolstra feel factor in the series. Like, oh, what are the, what, what are the Cavs going to have after sleep here? No, it's like, this is, they do what they do. Um, maybe Mitchell goes nuts, maybe LeVert goes nuts, but beyond that, like it's hard to see them throwing any real wrinkles here to to trip up what the the Celtics are trying to do. And one other thing that caught one stat that caught my eye from the first round, the Cavs shot fewer than thirty threes per game, and I just feel like if you're not going to shoot more, you're not going to have much of a chance against the Celtics because, like Packard said, it just becomes a game of math. And chances are you're you're not going to have more talent than the Celtics. This Cavaliers team definitely doesn't. And if you're staying inside the arc, if you're not getting to the free throw line a lot, and the Celtics rarely foul guys, um, and outside of Mitchell, it's not like the Cavs have guys who are going to be getting to the line much. It's just it's going to be really hard to beat the Celtics. Like I, I just feel like you have to have a more dynamic offense than that. You have to be able to, to produce threes, generate threes, and obviously make them too, but that that that's that really caught my eye, and especially because when the Cavs were playing at their best from January to March, whenever it was, and I think they it were went eighteen and two over that eighteen period. and two, and they had an eleven point something net rating um, over the, a two month span, which is basically what the same net rating the Celtics have had this season. So they were awesome, but they were shooting a ton of threes, and they were playing a different formula. And and so the fact that they've changed so much and that they're struggling to generate the threes that they did back then, it's kind of alarming. Uh, and I think especially in this matchup, like that's going to be a tough stat to overcome. Yeah, I mean, it feels like 
there, a lot of things are, are tilted in the Celtics' favor um, in this matchup. You mentioned the kind of coaching matchup, um, and it's interesting that they, they were playing so well, launching all these threes, and then kind of have not stuck with that. Um, this just popped in my head. Did you guys see the Joe Missoula, like mindset video on NBC Sports Boston? where he fedor- forced the uh, producer of the piece to get in a cold tub. Yes. Yes, I did. <laughs> that was Would you guys get in a cold tub to interview Joe Missoula? Yeah. 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 Why not? <laughs> Why not? Why not? I haven't been, have you guys done a cold tub? Have you done one of those? Like, I haven't done one of those before. Um, I used to do, like, ice baths in right. uh, college. Not, like, full tub, though. Yeah. They got a lot of stuff at the Auerbach Center. Like they got all sorts of tubs. They got all sorts of fancy. Things. Yeah, that, I mean, the fact he does that before every game is great. Hot tub. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's cool stuff. I, I like the like Joe is such a. I know it's just I know we're harping on it again, but just a just a maniac who loves the uncomfortable and just to force a guy to get uh, like if you're going to interview me, you have to do that. I think he understood how hilarious of a move that was and did it anyways. Um, and so I really like uh, appreciated that. Another cool thing, the Celtics are doing like a full behind the scenes documentary of this playoff run that's coming out on Twitter uh, with a new hashtag, all in. What is it? All, everybody's in, all in for Celtics. Um, I'll check up on that. But um, but the other question I wanted to ask you guys was, who do you think is going to become public enemy number one for uh, Celtics fans? Um, and why is it George's Niang? <laughs> He's a Boston guy. Yeah, he's a guy. No, but he's going to come in and people are going to make fun of his body because people body shame and don't no. let. And he's going to play a little bit more physical and have a cheap foul. Uh, I feel like, well, if it's not George Niang, who else on you're, this? You're overlooking the obvious here. The, the the guy that Celtics fans already hate is Tristan Thompson. Al Horford needs his revenge because I think Tristan Thompson has beat Al Horford in every single playoff series they've ever gone against each other, and most of that is Cavs Hawks. Uh, but it's got to be sweet revenge right now for Al Horford. I think it's their fifth time matching up in the playoffs. And it'll probably be – but I don't think you can hate Tristan Thompson because he'll his play will be so bad. And so it's like you need someone who's got to come in who's a, maybe a little bit good, maybe plays a little bit dirty. I don't know if Tristan Thompson's the dirtiest player. This is a, a halfway related observation. So today after Game 7, Jalen Suggs was crying. and. And clearly very emotional. <laughs> and Tristan Thompson went over and like gave him this big speech. It looked like on the telecast. He just seems like that guy. Like, like you don't necessarily want to talk to him. <laughs> he's and, gonna give you a speech. But he's going to give you a speech no matter what. He is going to to think he's the leader that you need, the voice that you desperately crave. He just always believes that that he's that guy. So I, I just do miss- a Tristan Thompson Zoom where he's saying just whatever the fuck comes to his mind. He was a great uh, nonsense quote guy. Not a big Kevin O'Connor yeah, guy. Yeah, ripping KOC <laughs> the two hours after making his way for two hours after the game for him. Yeah, he, t- he tortured Kevin O'Connor that one night. I forget exactly what he said about him, but... Keyboard warrior? He said Twitter fingers or something like that? I'm going to find it right now. Yeah. Because it that was, was funny. It was KOC ripped him on... Or he like, said some they, people in the locker room uh, didn't want, like, KOC had a classic, like, sources close to the situation right. say Tristan Thompson's uh, not the most favored guy in the locker room and it did not uh, make Tristan Thompson uh, happy to hear. But I yeah, think he said, was, like, Twitter fingers or something like that, keyboard warrior, something along those lines. One of the sneaky best moves of Brad Stevens' tenure is when they traded Tristan Thompson after that season, they actually got a second round pick. <laughs> for Tristan Thompson after that, like depressing. And then he was superseded. I think the, the Kings, I forget where he went. The Kings or the Hawks. Someone pretty much cut him um, half the way through that year, I feel like. But it's. <laughs> he said, I'm not going to let some guy with Twitter fingers try to bring down what I've built. Good attempt, <laughs> Mr. O'Connor, but I'm Teflon steel. You can't bring me down like that. I'm too blessed. Also said that guy, Kevin O'Connor, I don't know if I should mention her na- his name or not because he doesn't deserve my two cents, but I remember every name because I'm like an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, he was sort of playing basketball like an elephant. Um, so with him saying I'm not liked in the locker room, that was funny because that's not the case. Eh. Eh. Well, 
Well, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, we, is KOC going to show up in Boston for this series? Is, is, no, uh, KO, is that their showdown? Is too much of a celebrity. KOC is only showing up if it's the finals. That's probably true. Um, what else was? I can't believe Tristan Thompson is still in the NBA. It's uh, I'm shocked. He got amazing. suspended for what? Thirty games this year too, or something like fifty? For like PEDs? Yeah. yeah. Which no one gets caught for. Uh, fellas, do you guys have a prediction in this series? Or should we just predict every single game? I think that's going to be the prediction. If you give a prediction, you have to give me the sequence of games. Um, Jay, we'll start with you. What happens in game one? Celtics win. Game two. Celtics win. Game three. Celtics win. Game four. Celtics win again. Woo! Wow. The, sweep, the sweep from Jay King. All right, B-Rob, you're up. Game one. Celtics win. Game two. Celtics win. Game three. Celtics win. <laughs> Game four. Celtics lose. Oh, Ooh. game five. Celtics. No, Celtics win. I have the same as you. I think it's a classic gentleman sweep. Um, I think that it's a 3-0. They're up. They're going to try to coast. Donovan Mitchell scores at least 45 points. The Celtics are not as crisp as they need to be. And then they figure everything else and come back home. Okay. I got to ask you guys something. What did you think of Donovan Mitchell being mad at the Cleveland crowd for <laughs> chanting, we want Boston? <laughs> kind of a soft, like, weird move. I didn't see that. Yeah, I, I think he said he's upset because then it made Darius Garland miss a free throw. Um, but also, the Cavs fans, you saw how that worked out for Miami fans. I know it's a fun thing to chant at when you're about to win a, a playoff series, but... O'Shea Brissett was certainly upset about it. He's certainly going to make a new uh, YouTube video. Um, but a weird move by Donovan Mitchell to be like try to like scolding the home fans for doing like very stereotypical fan behavior. It'd be like it'd be like someone just getting mad at like fans doing the wave. It's just completely irrational. I mean, calm down. <laughs> it, it's. I think the the Cavs have lost. The Cavs lose all credibility to get mad at the fans after they tank to get into the four seed. Like they literally gave up on the last game of the season where they could have gotten the two seed and avoided the Celtics in the second round. So this is like I'm sorry, Dominic. He knows he like he knows what's coming. And I guess they saved everyone's job by winning this first round series, at least in the front, you know, bigger staff and and the front office, maybe. But um yeah, I mean Mitchell knows what's Mitchell knows what's coming. I also enjoy that O'Shea Brissett has called out twice now people cook the fans asking for the Celtics. He knows his role. It's it's, it's basically to make hype up videos at this point. But he's he's also like like Michael Malone was last year, where he knows his his team can cash his checks, and so he's just just down to say whatever because his teammates are just going to go out there and win basketball game. Can I ask your guys thoughts on? All right, we can finish this up, but I want to get your guys' initial thoughts on Nuggets Wolves too. Once we uh, after that crazy game yesterday, but you that was. Going. That was fun. That was a lot of fun. Um, so I I don't think Anthony Edwards will always shoot that well. He's been on a heater for the first five games of the playoffs. But he's also a different type of guard than the Nuggets ever played last year during their run. And obviously they've played LeBron twice now, but LeBron's not the same level of athlete he used to be. He's, he's not the same dynamic athlete that that edwards is at at this age and and so edwards just can kind of test Jokic in the pick and roll in ways that that teams haven't been able to do um because the suns last year the nuggets played them and booker and durant they just want to get to the mid-range and shoot shoot jumpers in your face they're not gonna like really attack you downhill like edwards is so so that's that's the part. And then I, I just thought Denver was just weak. Denver didn't have the physicality. Like Ant was just backing guys down and scoring on them. They weren't standing their ground. I I did not think the the Nuggets played well at all. I did not think they were ready for that sort of challenge. And the Timberwolves are tough. They're big and they're strong and they're physical. And, and, and they the next level to the game plan all the time. And just really, really, you can tell they believe in what they do a whole lot. Their, their level of defense with the two bigs, but then also um, McDaniel and just Edwards is a, is a supreme athlete. I just thought, like, 
obviously it feels like Jamal Murray's still a little bit hurt and that uh, changes the kind of how dangerous the Nuggets offense could be. But if you were trying to imagine just like ways to possibly slow down uh, Jokic, I think having like the seven foot Rudy Gobert there is like, obviously Jokic is still going to get his and still be a dynamic player. But just the, I think it was only like maybe two or three times where Gobert like uh, swatted away the, the kind of like fake shot lob to Aaron Gordon, but just having a way to like, kind of like take that away and Gobert's ability to guard too. And you still have all of this size on the court with, um, Cat McDaniel Ant to guard uh, pretty much everyone else. I think it's a it's an awesome matchup, and I'm really excited to see how the Nuggets come back and respond because I think definitely heading into the playoffs, they're like the prohibitive favorite to win um, the West, and that's like it's for the first time in a while I can remember the Nuggets kind of getting like punched in the mouth because um, I don't remember it be like really having um, them they didn't trail in a series last year. I was gonna, I was gonna guess that, but it certainly didn't feel like it. So it's gonna be very fascinating to see how they kind of come back in game two, um, and how they respond. And part of it will just be like Jokic needs to make shots. He went two for nine from threes, and they were for the most part giving him those threes. So if he goes, if he hits a couple more of those, it's a different game. Um, it's so I expect- insane though that he's like such a dominant inside scorer, and it's like, yeah, but he just needs to, you know, shoot closer to four. Well, he's also and dominant, he can, and he can. Yeah. It's so wild. The three he had at the end of the game to kind of keep it close, where he just like came off a screen and immediately like hit that shot. It was like after dominating in the post two possessions earlier. It's like, what this guy's in, oh, it's just wild to watch him play. Yeah, I feel like, and it's going to be fun to see him kind of figure out this challenge. Because a lot of the time the game looks super easy to him, and game one, for the Not first easy. time I can remember in the playoffs, the Nuggets just felt sped up. Like they weren't executing what they wanted to. They weren't getting to what they wanted to. The Timberwolves really made them play uncomfortable for one of the first times I can remember in a in a big game. So this is gonna be fun. It's gonna be a great series. Like just the. The matchups that you guys laid out and like the Nuggets, they won the first year, like first round series in five, but two of those games were buzzer beaters. Like they, they did not dominate that Lakers series. They dominated in crunch time, obviously, but um, the, the fact that the Wolves just like completely destroyed the Suns in four games, like they may be, you know, an under the radar, not juggernaut, but just like a team that's just built for like, playoff matchups here and they were like the only team that took a game off the Nuggets at all last year before the finals I think so they they clearly um have a year together now and are, are maybe putting it together at the right time we're, we're gonna find out I guess let's keep jumping around the playoffs before we uh we end this one I don't have a lot of strong thoughts but I also think Mavericks Thunder is going to be a, a pretty fascinating series to see it's the first real test we're gonna see of the young Thunder team I still think the Thunder are better constructed team um but the mavericks have been playing great basketball jay do you have any hot takes insight predictions for thunders uh thunder mavericks i'm interested to see this one because um obviously like the thunder have risen to every challenge so far this year but deeper in the playoffs you get into a possession game and, and that's when all your warts start to show up and so, obviously, Pelicans weren't able to kind of lean on them in the first first series. But this Dallas team is big and athletic, and they have Luka, who's going to make great decisions throughout, and they have Kyrie, who's playing at an absurd level. Kyrie has just been on a roll lately. Um, his level of shot-making, his defensive intensity even, like he's just really playing good basketball right now. So I want to see whether the Thunder can just kind of maintain their form or whether this is the stage where it matters that they're not that physical, where it matters that they play Josh Giddy, who can't really shoot, where it matters that they're kind of a smaller team in the front court. Um, so I, I want to see all that. Uh, like, I think there's a chance that that Luca is able to get downhill and put his shoulder into Chet and finish over him. And even though Chet's an awesome rim protector, like there are just things you have to learn in the NBA. And I think, I think there's a chance Dallas can do that here, but 
but I'm also not going to discard this Thunder team, which has just been amazing all year. Yeah. The, and now Mavs did lose Cleaver, looks like, for I think the whole series looks like after he messed up his shoulder. So that's a pretty big injury for them. But yeah, if the Thunder goes small, like, and they're kind of small with Chet at the five, it's like, are Lively and Gafford going to be able to kind right. of stay out there? It's a it's a great well, fascinating matchup athletic, between like like they're the the Maverick size and the Thunder speed, but the, the Maverick they're fast too. Like Lively can run, Gafford can run. They got like their whole support. Derek Jones Jr. might be the most athletic man alive. <laughs> like, Dante Dante Exum is 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 big and fast. Like they really put they clearly tried to assemble a roster with just big athletes around Kyrie and Luca who could handle the defense while those guys do most of the offense and it's worked so far um so i yeah i, I want to see this one because I, I actually have a, a abnormally high belief i think in the mavs pretty unusual i i think they've got a chance to to really contend this year um just because they have finally assembled defense around luca and luca even is participating some on that end so and these these are two of the b- best teams left to me. Yeah, it's it's pretty the path they could have asked for a better path here for the Dallas with like with Kawhi getting hurt in the first round and now OKC you certainly would take them over the other side of the West bracket. But it's also I mean, I'm just realizing now, guys, like there's no teams left in the West in like the Pacific time zone. These are all like middle like which is honestly great for start times for this series for like the second round only nine thirty and tens. But also just like when you think about travel for the rest of the way, it's like I, I can't remember the last time there's just been no like all no the California, California teams team, are yeah. gone in the second round and even Phoenix too, obviously. So it is just uh that middle of the country, the the OKC Dallas Real Denver, America. Real America. Uh, yeah. Um I don't know if we have to really talk about this, but what what Nixon Nixon five, Nixon six. How about the Bucks and the Sixers just being done? Period. From like a, for for all the talk for the year, like the side of the bracket they're gonna be on, the side like just straight up not even in the second round. So much of our talk to start the year was like, it's the three, it's the tier of the top. It's the Sixers, the Celtics, and the Bucks. And it is for them. I guess injuries happen, but it's kind of wild that the East kind of has happened as the way it did. I've got some hostility inside me. Let it because... out. Jordan. Let it out. No, I just think, like I've seen. Sixers fans like like happy with with the team's effort. I've seen them like excited about the way they went out. I, I've seen people legitimately like, oh yeah, they gave it everything they had. Like they they left it all out there. Like, well, they got cap room, Jay Max cap room. Embiid even was like, yeah, like great great group of guys. We really. Like, what are you talking <laughs> about? You're the reigning MVP. You lost in the first round. You couldn't beat a Knicks team that nobody expects to actually compete for a championship. You still haven't been out of the second round ever. You were close in every fourth quarter, but eh, big fella, you never grabbed any rebounds in the fourth. You shot 23% in all of fourth quarters. quarters. I just don't understand how people watched that and thought, you know what? This is great. Did they compete? Sure. They competed. They tried except for Joel Embiid in the fourth quarter because he he couldn't muster the the stamina to do it. But I just don't understand how there is not like an insane amount of heat right now on this whole team from Daryl Morey, who went and just did nothing. Like, I get it. You want to have cap space in the future? You have Joel Embiid, whose body is fragile, whose miles are piling up, and and you just decided, eh, let's let's essentially punt this year, because he never that team was never good enough to win. They it. got Buddy Healed. What are you talking about? He scored yeah. seventeen points in game six. That worked well. I I just think it's it's embarrassing that they are getting treated with kid gloves after getting booted in the first round by a Knicks team that's good but not great. They should and look, they could go out. They could go get Paul George. They could go out. They could go after a bunch of other quality free agents. They should look better next year. Maury was probably right to choose patience. But to me, it's like they've had the MVP. They've had a guy who's considered one of the two or three best players in basketball, and they haven't even made the Eastern Conference fucking finals. 
it's just sad and and to see people give them credit for losing to the Knicks in six is just it's bad I don't understand it I never will understand it I've seen too much of it and and honestly if Joel Joel and B was he was obviously key to them the whole series he was great most of the series fourth quarters he was just flat out bad he couldn't defend at the high level he couldn't rebound he couldn't score he was passing up jumpers didn't seem to want the ball and i don't know man they found maxi that's awesome he's great it seems like he just keeps growing leaps and bounds clearly a very hard worker but i just i don't think they should be getting patted on the back because because they were able to compete with the new york knicks I'm like let's let's tone that down let's tone that all the way down Oh, they just didn't have enough in this series. They played hard, though. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> that's that's the standard we're holding them to now? Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Given that's... the like the success they've or the lack of success they've had, like they've never made it past the second round. Like, why are you being patient with how bad the East was this year outside of the Celtics? So like the Bucks never looked right. Everyone else is was on paper a step below the Sixers are. Like, this is a huge if if they did anything semi decent at the trade deadline, they probably get past the Knicks team and are in a really good shape to get to the conference finals. And yeah, maybe you like you go on a thing, but anything can happen at that point. But now it's like if they don't get Paul George this offseason, like what is the plan? Like Drew Holiday is like I can't throw a bunch of money at Drew Holiday now, so let's take care of him. There's not a lot of even premier names in the market. And on B, you might be looking at with his injury situation now, like has he played his best basketball in his career, period? Like just because of injuries, like you have to start asking that question. Um, it's not BJ, it's it's like it's a it's a sad state of affairs for Philly, given just how how many changes they've had and how many times they've just let opportunities slip through their fingers in fourth quarters, whether it was game six against the Celtics last year or losing all these games at home to the Knicks, who are a gritty team, but are literally playing like six guys right now and don't have their second best player on the on the floor, period. Like this is it's 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 I don't know how Maury is going to get away with it, but I guess this they better hope they sign someone. And it's it, maybe I'm being too hard on Embiid because he played through a significant injury. He was clearly in pain. He wasn't right. But he was dominant the first three quarters of basically every game. And it's he just... 50 in the series. Like, he was capable of being a dominant player. It's just crazy to me that not everyone was criticizing him for disappearing basically every fourth quarter. Every fourth quarter, he was a non-factor. Tyrese Maxey was the reason they came back in game five and extended the series past five games. They should have lost in five. Do you blame that on fatigue, Jay, or like, or just the fact that he just doesn't, he's like not that guy in the fourth quarter in playoffs? For Probably him. fatigue, but that's that's why he's never been that guy. Right. Right. Is because he's never been in the condition to play his best basketball late. And you can lean on him and you can be athletic against him. Like Precious Achua was getting every rebound. Precious Achua. It wasn't even Mitchell Robinson. It wasn't even Isaiah Hartenstein. It was Precious Achua that, that one game. What was that, game four? It's like, I don't know. I just think the MVP should be held to a higher standard than this. But I did not anticipate this podcast ending with uh, 10 minutes of anti-Philadelphia 76ers talk, but I'm here for it. <laughs> uh, I'm glad that it happened. It does seem like someone needs to move down to that city and clean it up. Um, I don't know who's going to do that, but we'll see moving forward. Look for some places, potentially, some areas that could use some help down there. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? We'll see. Um, this has been the free episode of Still Potable here on CLNS YouTube. We appreciate everyone for tuning in. If you want more Still Potable from us every day, Monday through Friday, and extra days uh, now, we're doing podcasts after every single game. Go to patreon.com slash still potable. Subscribe today. We've got fantastic chat in the community on the Patreon app. Got uh, different tiers you can join if you want content from us in the playoffs. We really appreciate everyone who tuned in here on CLNS YouTube, everyone who tuned in on the free version of the podcast. But again, if you want more Celtics content, we are giving you a podcast every single day, Monday through Friday. Patreon.com slash still potable. We very much appreciate you guys tuning in. For Jay King from The Athletic, for Brian B. Rob Rob, I am Sam Jam Packard. We'll be back tomorrow with more Celtics talk here on Still Potable.